these things will be provided to you. Do not be afraid, little flock, because your Father has chosen to give you the kingdom. Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. Lord, we ask you just to, to bless us this morning, and we open our ears and our hearts to receive what you have for us in this house today, Lord. Lord, we thank you and we love you. Yes, it's a little different passage. I know Mother's Day, but uh, this is just the way the, the Lord was leading me. Um, on Mother's Day, first with no, a noble career. There is no career more noble than that of motherhood at its best. There are no possibilities greater, and in no other sphere does failure bring more serious penalties. And its results affect generations to come. On the other hand, there is no higher height to which humanity can attain than to occupy by a converted heaven inspired praying mother. A mother's heart. A teacher asked a boy this question. She asked, suppose you have a pie and there are five children and your parents, so there's seven of you in the family, and you cut this pie up and you distribute it to, each other, to everybody, you, you cut it up, how many, what is the fraction of how many pieces you have? And he says to the teacher, one-sixth. And she said, no, I don't think you know your fractions. I don't think you understand the question. And he said, no, it's one-sixth. She said, no, there's seven of you. Not, there's seven. There's five kids and parents. There's seven of you. And he said, no, I don't think you understand. I don't think you know my mother. And she said, what? She said, I don't think you know my mother. My mother would pass it out and not take a piece for herself because she said she didn't want any pie. That's how we want to be just looked at as our child, especially as mother. You want to be seen as this giving heart. You want to be seen as a loving person. And that is where the nurturing side and the caring side of a mother's heart comes in. Because many of us know our mother would give up a piece of pie so the other, all the kids could have a bigger piece. They would just say they didn't want it. That's how we want to be looked at. All mothers want to be seen like their children. There's a, a poem written, or a, a passage written by Nicole Johnson. It's an article called I Am Invisible. And here's part of the article. It says, It all began to make sense. The blank stares, the lack of response, the way one of the kids will walk into the room while I am on the phone and ask to be taken to the store. And inside I'm thinking, can't you see I'm on the phone? Obviously not. No one can see if I am on the phone or cooking or sweeping the floor or even standing on my head in the corner because no one can see me at all. I am invisible. Some days I am only a pair of hands, nothing more. Can you fix this? Can you tie this? Can you open this? Some days I am not a pair of hands at all. I am not even a human being. I am a clock to ask what time it is. I am a satellite guide to answer what number is the Disney Channel. I am a Uber car, car to order to order what they want to eat. This is reality. And this is uh, how many mothers feel most of the time. You know, we go through these stages in our lives. Um, with the, in motherhood, I understand that I, mean, I've, I don't know it all because I'm not a mother. You know, what I do know just comes from experience of living with being almost married to 18 years uh, and to a mother of 16 years and being raised by a mother of 41 years and uh, <laughs> being around, I see these, the, how mothers react and, and how they deal with things and how they carry things. And they go through these spans, they feel like they're invisible at times because of all the needs and the wants of the family and what goes on in life. Um, another passage, I was reading, and it's called A Mother's Arms. And this is how most mothers feel with teenagers in their lives. There was a teenager who didn't want to be seen in public with her mother. How many of you guys have been there that had teenagers in your life? <laughs> because her mother's arms were terribly disfigured. One day when her mother took her shopping and reached out her hand, a clerk looked horrified. Later crying, the girl told her how embarrassed she was. Understandably hurt, the mother waited an hour before going to her daughter's room to tell her for the first time what had happened. When you were a baby, I woke up to the burning house. Your room was in an inferno. Flames were everywhere. I could have, had, I could have gotten out the front door, but I decided I'd rather die with you in my arms than I w than spend it without you. 
Then I went back through the flames, my arms on fire. When I got outside on the lawn, the pain was agonizing, but when I looked at you, all I could do was rejoice that the flames hadn't touched you. Stunned, the girl looked at her mother through new eyes, weeping in shame and gratitude. She kissed her mother's marred arms in her hands. That times is uh, the reality of being a child, teenager especially, when you're a teenager. The unappreciativeness of everything your mother does in your life, you don't even understand at times. But when the reality hits you, you understand fully of how much sacrifice has taken place in, in her life and in your life. And encourage on this Mother's Day as we, we open ourselves to the Lord and we open ourselves to life um, and understanding that you tell your mother thank you for all she did in her life. Tell her you, you love her. Tell her you thank her. Uh, and tell your children to, that you love them and, and that you want them to prosper and succeed in life. They may not understand at the time that their age they are, but later in life they will come to understand when they have their own kids and how hard it is. And throughout the Bible you can find a, a variety of women who dealt with motherhood struggles. Um, Eve, of course, the first mother who lost one child at the hands of another. Rebecca, Isaac's, Isaac, Isaac's wife, who struggled with favoritism of her son Jacob over Esau. Jochobed, a caring mother who had to give her son Moses up, basically for adoption. Mary, a mother who had to watch her son innocently beaten and killed. You know, when you read the Bible, there's a whole span of everything that happens in life. And you can fully understand there's women in the Bible that have went through many different things. And a lot of things that you deal with, we think we're alone. But it has happened in the Bible. And even sometimes to more extent in the Bible. The stories in, this, in, in, these, in these stories and passages in the Bible, they remind us of uh, that the relationship between mothers and children aren't always perfect. That God, but God is at work even in the tough situations. It's tough enough sometimes to care for ourselves, but adding in the responsibilities we have towards our children can sometimes feel overwhelming. Our great assurance is that God is at work redeeming our biggest mistakes and failures in these relationships for both parents and children alike. One thing that I've learned through watching the mothers in my life is uh, that mothers worry. Um, they just worry. They worry about their children all the time. And this is where this passage that we read comes into play. Mothers worry over everything in their children's lives. And uh, today we're looking at this passage and see how Jesus tells us to deal with worry in our life. He speaks about this in this passage and to worry. In verse 22 through 25, he talks about how not to worry because our life is fleeing you. And even the worry that we have can't add a day to our life. And if all this worry can't even add a day to our life, then why are we worried? Because everything else is so menial and, and less meaning in our lives. So he's saying, why worry? Give it to him. Give it to God. Because it's not important. It's not even important. And there's nothing you can do about it. We discover our inability uh, in our life through Jesus when in and Jesus is asking him through his disciples when he's talking to the disciples in this passage. And you get to verse 26, it makes it clear that this is Jesus' point. He wants you to see that your inability to change, that your inability to, to do things in your worry. Jesus is confronting us with our inability. The length of a person's life is determined by God. It isn't, some, it isn't something you can control. And no amount of worry will make a scrap of difference in it. But the root of all worry is that part of us feels that maybe we can control these things. Jesus' question, let's, you know, in this passage is one good thing to do in our lives is take this question just like Jesus is here with us in our life. Like he's asking you in your life the questions about it. So say Jesus is sitting here and he says, which of you by worrying can ensure that your children, your child will not have an accident? Just act like Jesus is asking you this this morning. Which of you in here, by worrying, can prevent your kid from having an accident? 
Which of you, by worrying, can protect your child from the pressures of the world? Which of you, by worrying, can become an ideal parent? Which of you, by worrying, can bring eternal life to your son or to your daughter's soul? Discovering our inability can be one of the first steps in freedom in our faith with Jesus Christ. That he can do all things. That we don't have control, and by worrying, it doesn't make us have control. But if we learn to give it to him, he is the one in control. You know, examine the direction of your heart. There is a, is a clearly a relationship between the things that you have set your heart on and the things that you worry you. That's the problem. With setting your heart on things like the safety and health of something, of your child, is that these factors are obviously not in our control. This is the point of the tension for all of us who are Christian parents. We want our children to follow Christ. We want our children to uh, have a Christ-led life. But we also want our children to have a pain-free life. And this is where we come into play. It's hard to do because the truth is that having a Christ-led life and being a Christian is not a pain-free life. You can't have your, your cake and eat it too in this situation. But this is not without hope because Scripture teaches us, Jesus says that he is the shepherd. He is the shepherd. He tells us in Scripture that we are cast out into this world and we are cast out with sheep, with wolves and sheep clothing. That we are out there with the wolves and everything. And our children, and at times this is why we worry with our kids, especially mothers. They worry about the, the safety of their children. They worry about the souls of their children. They worry about the decisions that they make in this life. They worry about everything in their children. But this is where Jesus is saying, why worry? You can't control these things. But what you do is you lay it upon him because isn't he the good shepherd? Isn't he the good shepherd? Isn't he the one that's going to help lead your child? Don't you think that the good shepherd will lead them down the right path? Don't you think that the good shepherd, even if they get astray and lost, will chase them down and break their leg and throw them over his shoulder and bring them back? Don't you trust the shepherd enough to watch over your children? Don't you trust the shepherd enough that they will come to know him, even in later in life? It may take time. It may take time. It may not be in your timing. You may not see it right away, but you trust him enough that you have laid the groundwork. You have laid in their life Christ, and you trust it to him that they will come home, that he will reach them, that they will come back to him. There's worry. Why worry? There's nothing you can do about these things. The worry is just going to bring sickness and stress in your life. He says, do not worry because these things you cannot control. But give it to him because he is the good shepherd. He is the one in control in these situations. And you get down to verse 30 through 32 in this passage. It says, and it starts verse 30. It says, for all these things are what the nations of the world eagerly seek. And your father knows that you need these things. But seek his kingdom and these things will be provided to you. Do not be afraid, little flock, because your father has chosen to give you the kingdom. Your heavenly father who cares for each of his children more than we can ever care for them. More than we can ever can. This father is the shepherd of the flock. Is the true that God never promises a pain-free life to us or our children. In fact, it's almost the opposite. He sends us out to the wolves. But this is where the faith and the trust in Christ comes into play. You know, we worry about the choices they make. We worry about their faith and everything in their lives. But we have to learn to trust in the, in the good shepherd and, and what he has planned for our children and what he has planned in their lives. Because it's greater than we could ever plan ourselves. It's greater than we could ever lay out for them or try to make them do. Uh, you know, or try to have them succeed in. His plans are always greater. Your Heavenly Father does not promise that the way we will be will be easy, but He does promise that He will be with you all the way. All the way. He's always with us. He'll be with them all the way in life. He, com he confronts you with the, your inability. He warns you about where you set your heart. He invites you to trust your Heavenly Father. Just this passage alone, when you read it, this passage, he's talking to his disciples. This comes right after the, the parable of the rich fool. 
And the rich fool, when you, if you go back later for times to read this in Luke, the parable of the rich fool, and Jesus is talking to his disciples because he sees the worry. He sees because a lot of times, even not being a mother, but even just human, uh, in this world we worry about things. And we worry about, as a father sometimes, we worry about providing you know, food and shelter and these things in our family. And mothers, are, you know, you worry about everything. You know, a lot of times you're raising, you know, not just your kids, but you're also another kid in your life. And that's your husband. <laughs> I can admit that. There's times I'm a little childlike. <laughs> yeah, I see all the wives. Oh, yeah, uh-huh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So you, you carry the worry. You know, you carry these, these things in your life you worry about. And because a lot of times, uh, I know as a, like a lot of guys and a lot of men, we're willy-nilly. We just kind of go with it. You know, spur of the moment, a lot of things, and and then then our wives are left with the worrying about, oh, now uh, where's this going to come from? Where's this money? What's this going to happen? What's going to happen if he's out there playing with the kids, being an idiot, and he's going to break his leg? And then we got to financially, you know, he's going down a sledding hill on standing up on a sled, thinking he's 20 years old again. You know, he's going to eat it. You know, that's the worry that comes into play. And guys, we just sometimes don't do it until it happens. Then we're worried. Oh, why would I do that? That's the pride thing in us. But we all carry some extent of worry in our life. And Jesus here is telling his disciples this passage in this parables because he knows the worry that you're carrying. He knows that we carry these things in this world that we live in. But he wants you to remind you, a lot of times the worry is not there. The worry, he wants to remind you of your inability because we have no control over these things. And he's saying, if in the passage you look, he's saying, even the birds have something to eat. <clears throat> These birds don't store food up. They don't, they, don't, they don't set it aside for winter. These birds just have it to eat, and he never lets them go hungry. If he cares enough for a bird, how much more can he care for you? And he's saying the flowers, these flowers that bloom there look so brilliant and so bright, more than King Solomon ever did with all his money and his, and his robes and his garments. And he's saying, if these flowers look that brilliant, and they're here today and they're gone tomorrow because they're here for a moment, then they'll burn up in a trash pile or whatever. If he cares enough to make them look that good and clothe them that well, how much more does he care for his children? How much more does he care for your children? That he's going to clothe them. That he's going to take care of them. And he's saying, put your trust in him. Put your faith in him. Put your faith in him. This morning, but for just time's sake, as we get ready to close, on this Mother's Day, you know, Jesus wanted, you know, God, when I was praying about it, He just wanted to talk about it because this is something, it's not just talking about the women about it, but it's something that we deal with, and I know mothers deal with, especially as worry in their life. And at times it seems overwhelming, the worry in your life seems overwhelming, especially at stages in your life when you're working and you're busy and you're doing all these things. And it feels like there's no appreciation. It feels like nobody even sees you. Just like the, the poem I was reading, that you know, I'm invisible. I know and I understand that at times it feels like, especially when you have teenage kids, that they don't appreciate anything you do. And all you do is worry. But at times it feels like you're just running rampant. It feels like you're just, you're just there to serve. And nobody cares what you even think or even want. And that's not true because God has put you in their life and given you them for a reason. He's put them in your life for a reason. And at times it seems like they're knuckleheads and they're doing stupid things and they're, they make bad decisions and you're thinking, I didn't raise you like that. I raised you better than that. I've heard that, you know, how many times in my life? <laughs> Personally, I've dealt with this. I've raised you better now. What are you thinking? We feel that way as parents. You know, I understand. But Jesus is telling us here in this passage, says, why are you worried? Give them to me. Do, do you not trust the good shepherd? Do you not think that he's in control? Do you not think that he can have his plans are better than our plans, that he will lead them down the path that they need to go down? And this morning he's saying, well, don't worry. I'm in control. Lay your worry upon me this morning. Lay your, your doubts upon me this morning. When it seems like all is lost, give it to me. Jesus is here and he's calling you this morning. See, do not worry. Do not worry. Before we close this morning, I'm just going to read a, 
just a you know thank you letter basically or, or notes that would just be from children to their mothers you know to my mother and uh, many of you mothers just listen because this is what an older child says to their mother after they've lived a little life and they understand some of the things that went on in their life it says thank you for putting Christ before me you taught me from the word go that I am not that I'm not the center of your world because I'm not the center of the world and you told me who does who has that position the Lord Jesus I was never allowed to rule our house and you always made it clear that my opinions and preferences though important are not authoritative thank you for the times Thank you for the times that you were not able to spend time with me because because you were ministering to someone else. Thank you that I never and never thank you in never treated me like the most important person in your life. You pointed me to the most important person in the cosmos. Thank you for showing me grace, not works. You did so much for me, and you never threw it back. <coughs> Sorry. I didn't think it'd be this hard. <laughs> my mom's not even here. Thank you for, thank you, you did so much for me, and you never threw it back, you never threw it back at me. threw it back at me to make me feel guilty never suggested that your love depended on me reaching a certain standard never held a grudge after I had let you down never wondered out loud why you were bothered at sports and at school they taught me that it was best to win and that work that work pays at home you taught me that I don't need to be good enough to be accepted and that love gives and thank you for the dis disciplining me and discipling me fairly and firmly and forgiving me completely and repeatedly <laughs> thank you that the boundaries were clear and that accounts were kept short thank you for showing me repentance not false perfection you made mistakes lots of them thanks thank you for not excusing them or belittling them thank you that you would stop and say sorry to me and sorry to God in front of me thank you that you knew you were forgiven and, and lived as though you were Thank you that you always back me, but never, <laughs> never excused my sin or let me think I was, I was good enough for God. Thank you that I learned from you not to wear a mask or self-righteousness, but that you taught me to enjoy wearing Christ's clothes of true righteousness. Thank you for caring more about my character than my abilities. You encouraged me to be kind, thoughtful, and patient 
more than you urge me to do well at school, learn an instrument, or get good at sports. It's not that you didn't help me with homework, make me practice music, or take me to football, but I always knew that who I was and who I was becoming mattered more than what I could do. Thank you for knowing that the God, that gospeling me was more was your, you and your dad, you and my dad's job. Thank you that you told me Bible stories, sang Bible songs with me, prayed with me, and you told me about God as we went about our day-to-day -day chores and trips. Thank you that you didn't think you could delegate this job to my children's and student and youth pastors and leaders. Thank you that you didn't shoehorn Christ into every conversation as though men mentioning him every other sentence would convict convert me. But thank you that he didn't that he didn't need shoehorning in because he was a constant companion in our family. Thank you that I'm one of those kids who can't remember the first time they they were told about the Lord Jesus and can't remember a day since when they didn't hear about him. Thank you for loving dad. He makes mistakes, lots of them. <laughs> More than you, mom. Thank you that he that you loved him, that you forgave him when you needed to and asked for forgiveness when you needed to. That you laughed with him, that you were affectionate with him, that you submitted to him, that you cried with him, that you thank you that you did all those things in front of me so that because of because of the wife you were to him, I know what it means to be a Christian man, husband, and father. Thank you for showing me what sacrificial love is every day of my life since, since the very first. You've done something for me that was hard or costly for you. In the way you've mothered me, I can see a glimmer of how Christ lived and died for me. You've shown me Christ. Just a thank you to a mother. And think about from an older child who's lived a little, made a lot of mistakes in his life. And at times, I'm sure, as a parent, they weren't sure that I was even going to be in church or involved in my walk, in my relationship with God. And I'm sure at times there was a lot of worry about who I was to become and the decisions that I made and how they would affect my life forever. And at times I knew there was worry of my safety and the things I was doing because there was a lot of stupid mistakes and stupid decisions that took place. But just think, when you have children, worry doesn't change anything. Worry cannot affect anything, but prayer can do all things. And giving them over to the Lord, Jesus Christ, can do all things. This morning as we close, as you can stand in this house, I'm here to speak hope into life, hope in your life as a mother. And there's many mothers in here, I know, understand you worry. For all ages, you have children that are babies and you have adult children. And each stage of their life, there's worry because you're worried if you're going to be a good parent. You're worried if you're making the right decisions. You're worried if you're reflecting Christ in the things that you do in their life. You're worried as they get older that the things that they're doing is just stupid at times. And you're worried that, are they even going to come back to Christ? You're worried, are, are, are they going to die out there or what they're doing? And the worry goes on and on and never ends because it starts from when they're born until you have passed or they have gone. It's there and it's always there. Even when they're adults and have children of their own, there's times you worry about them. 
The worry is there, and I understand it's there. And this morning, Jesus is here, and he's saying, the worry isn't yours, and it's not yours alone. It won't affect. But bring it to me, all you heavy burden. Lay it at my feet, and I will pick it up, and I will help you walk it, and help you carry it, and help you go through this life. And he's saying, I know you get downtrodden, and you get beaten down at times as mothers. And it seems like everything's crashing in and we can have no control at times. But he's saying, give it to me because I am the good shepherd. Lay your children to, over to me. Pray for them. Do not worry. Do not worry because I have them in my hands. Do not worry. Their life is in my hands. Give them to me. Lay them over to me this morning. This morning before we go out and into the world and we go out into our, you know, our dinners and our cookouts and our things we're doing. I think it's important we take a time just to come this morning. Just to come this morning and worship God this morning. Just come this morning, lay it at his feet. If you're struggling in your life right now, if you, you have worry in your life right now, if you're struggling because your children are, are being knuckleheads because a lot of children have been there, just give it to him this morning. Don't carry it anymore. And if you're a child that has a mother and you're struggling right now with your relationship with, with them, or you've lost them, they're no longer with you this morning, just come and lay it at his feet. Let him touch you this morning. Let him, let him wrap his arms around you this morning and comfort you today. As they start singing this song this morning, I encourage you just to come forward and meet him here right where you're at in your life. Meet him in this altar today.